I am unable to hear. Uh, just me. Uh, participants, can you please write down in the chat box? Uh, so the audio is not working for the participants. Mohit, we had done a trial run. It was working then. Yes, ma'am. Can we just do the troubleshooting? Yeah, so he's trying to, because in the evening we had done a trial run. At that time, the volume was working. Uh, so I don't know why it's Good not evening working. to all of you. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Thank Manjari. Uh, Ma'am, it is working well now. Yes, it is working. Participants, can you please answer? Uh, it's working. Yes, for them also it's working. Now we can proceed. Okay. For inviting me to deliver this talk on EEG and self childhood self limited epilepsies. So I hold on. Uh, can you hold on? I think I welcome Dr. Sangeeta also. Sangeeta, hi. Hi. Yeah, hi. So, uh, you know, Dr. Lim is uh, traveling, so Suvasini is giving the talk. Achha, 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 okay. Her talk is recorded because it's her father's 75th birthday. Okay, so, okay. question and answers we will have to take. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. she will answer later. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. welcome Dr. Sangeeta. Dr. Sangeeta is the Dean of the KEM Hospital. And uh, she's an uh, epileptologist in Mumbai. And uh, she has established the epilepsy surgery program in Mumbai. And she is a part of this uh, program and a co-chair uh, along with me. Yeah, thank uh, you, thank you. The first um, of the talk, which is trying to deal with epilepsy syndromes. So the learning objectives of today's session are that first I will discuss the concept of epilepsy syndromes and uh, then to understand the concept of self-limited epilepsy syndromes. And then we'll discuss the electroclinical features of common childhood self-limited epilepsy syndromes. So what is an epilepsy syndrome? An epilepsy syndrome is basically a characteristic cluster of clinical and EG features. So these are electroclinical syndromes. The electrical part is, of course, the EG findings. The clinical part is various things like the type of seizure, the age at onset, what comorbidities are there, what is the likely etiology. So these are often supported by specific etiological findings. And why is it important to have this category of epilepsy syndromes? Because the diagnosis of a syndrome in an individual with epilepsy frequently carries prognostic and treatment implications. And these are especially important to recognize, recognize in epilepsies in children. So just to give an example of two epilepsy syndromes. So for example, childhood absence epilepsy. So here the clinical part is the seizure type, which is typical absence seizures. The other clinical, these are usually seen in children 4 to 11 years of age and typically developing children. They're normal children. And the EEG shows typical 3 hertz spike wave discharges. So we have the childhood absence epilepsy and we know that it has good prognosis and what treatment to give. So once we get a syndromic diagnosis made, rather than just calling it an epilepsy or just a generalized epilepsy. Similarly, another syndrome, which we previously called West syndrome, now we call it infantile epileptic spasm syndrome. So it's again another electroclinical syndrome where the clinical part is the seizure type, which is infantile spasms. And fre frequently they have developmental delay. And the EG finding is hip arrhythmia. So we know that this has a guarded prognosis. This is a difficult to treat epilepsy syndrome. And what treatments to give normal, uh, normal anti-seizure medications do not work. We give them uh, steroids. So uh, the concept of epilepsy syndrome is very, very important, especially in pediatric epileptology. So this is the framework which is given in the 2017 um, Sheffer paper, uh, beautiful paper on the new seizure classification of seizures and um, epilepsies. So basically, the so first step is to classify seizures as focal, generalized, or unknown, depending on the onset. And this second step is the epilepsies. This is somewhat usually synonymous. And then the third step they say is look for epilepsy syndromes. Are you able to make a syndromic diagnosis? And then look at the etiology, which can be classified into structural, genetic, infectious, metabolic, and various comorbidities. So sometimes a syndromic diagnosis itself uh, gives you an etiology. Like, for example, if it's a childhood absence epilepsy, then we know the etiology is likely genetic. Uh, if the diagnosis is, say, Travay syndrome, then we know that it's caused by SCN1A mutations in majority of the cases. But many times the syndrome, if we just say, say, West syndrome, that is not an etiology. That is an age-dependent presentation and it can be 
because of various etiologies, for example, malformations or birth asphyxia, um, postnatal hypoglycemia or other conditions. So the syndrome sometimes itself gives the etiology, uh, sometimes it does not. So these are not uh, always, they don't always go together. So now coming to the concept of self-limited epilepsy syndromes. Now, as the term indicates self-limited, it means that they are going to go away. So it is. It means that there is. these are age-dependent syndromes where a spontaneous resolution is expected to occur with age. As the child grows past that typical age of the syndrome, the epilepsy will go away. So earlier, they were termed as benign epilepsy syndromes, and you had a number of them. So just a few examples of the common terms which you might be familiar with is benign childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes, which is PECS, benign familial neonatal seizures, benign myoclonic epilepsy of infancy, and early onset benign childhood occipital ep benign ep epilepsy, which was also called as panaticolos syndrome. So, so there are two main features. Why were they called benign uh, epilepsies? So first point was that these are the seizures, which are self-limited. So spontaneous remission will occur at expected age, regardless of treatment. That was the concept, whether you treat or not, it's going to go away. That was the general concept. And the consequences of the seizures are generally not disabling over the course of the active seizure disorder. So there is a time when this epilepsy is going to be very active, but the consequences are not going to be very generally not very disabling. However, this is again, so it is not totally benign. This does not preclude an increased risk of subtle to moderate cognitive and behavioral disorders prior to, during, or even extending beyond the active phase of seizures. So here is where the caveat that you're calling them benign, but are they actually benign? So, so why was they called, why were they called benign? The term benign was to uh, contrast them from the stigmatizing word epilepsy and to differentiate them from the most severe epileptic encephalopathies. And there was also a term catastrophic epilepsies, which is not now preferred at all because of such a negative connotation. And in general, the term benign in medicine means that it's not malignant. So if you have in cancer, we have benign and malignant uh, lumps and tumors or so something like that benign will reassure the family that this is going to be okay, uh, the child child will be fine. So there are little or no detrimental consequences and they are associated with a favorable prognosis for recovery and they're generally not life-threatening. So that was the um, idea behind calling them benign. Uh, but however, in 2010, this, this concept was challenged in the Berg paper. And uh, what was said is we definitely do not want to term catastrophic because catastrophic has very negative con uh, uh, connotations. And benign also is not really recommended because benign belies the growing understanding of the relationship between the epilepsies and a wide variety of brain disorders such as cognitive, behavioral, and psychiatric illnesses, as well as sudden death, sudep, suicide. So it's not so benign. Benign can be misleading and leave physicians, patients, and families unaware and unprepared to address these associated disorders. But at that time, at that time, the paper said that that said we don't think it's a good idea to call them benign, but we have not um, changed the names of the syndromes. And they suggested that uh, you can call it self-limited and have two terms, self-limited and pharmacoresponsive, right? Because if, if they're easily treated, that is that means pharmacoresponsive, don't call it benign. They're going to go away, call it self-limited, don't call it benign. So this last year, there was a whole series of wonderful papers which was uh, which were given by the ILA and I suggest that all of you should go through these papers. They're really beautiful papers. Uh, when they uh, so ILA has now given officially recognized syndromes, certain syndromes, classified them, given definition and how to recognize these syndromes. That has been given now by the ILA. And uh, so the uh, two papers, there are a set of actually uh, five papers. But the two papers which deal with self-limited epilepsies are the Zuberi paper, which deals with epilepsy in neonates and infants, and the Specchio paper, which deals with uh, epilepsy syndromes in uh, onset in childhood. So I will start with the uh, self-limited epilepsies in neonates and infants. And there are, I will not deal with all of them, just the common ones. So these include self-limited neonatal epilepsy, self-limited familial neonatal infantile epilepsy, self-limited infantile epilepsy. So these are all a category of um, uh, conditions in which there are uh, newborns who have seizures. These newborns otherwise are well, 
they are well they don't have any encephalopathy they don't seem to have any birth asphyxia any other condition they have seizures depending on various age groups some will have seizure on day two some will have seizure on day six some any time during early infancy uh, family history may or may not be present so all this classification is depending on whether family history is present uh, what is the age of presentation and ultimately of course it's a diagnosis of exclusion <coughs> on day one we can never say that this newborn has self-limited epilepsy on day one of course we will work up the baby for all causes like um, hypoglycemia hypocalcemia any brain malformation we'll get an eg we'll get an mri all that is done and the baby is otherwise totally fine and we get an eg to see that there is no uh, presence of any epileptic encephalopathy everything looks fine then you can uh, uh, you know and this is seizures are very easily controlled so by say by about three months you can be confident that yes we, we were probably dealing with a self-limited neonatal epilepsy especially we are more confident if there's a family history that uh, one parent had similar seizures as a newborn then we can be more confident and uh, then we can actually the good thing is that you can uh, the uh, take off the anti-seizure medications pretty quickly in these infants the other category here is genetic epilepsy with febrile seizure plus so again febrile seizures are very common in children but some of them can have uh, other features like they can have afebrile seizures as well they can have a positive family history or they can have febrile seizures occurring earlier than the typical age which is six months to five years or persisting beyond five years so and especially if they have uh, so those conditions are called febrile seizure plus anything which is beyond the spectrum of typical febrile seizures that is febrile seizure plus and when we have a family history positive then it is likely to be a genetic epilepsy with febrile seizure plus and the last in this category is uh, myoclonic epilepsy of infancy which is which was called benign myoclonic and now the term benign has been removed but uh, interestingly for this self limited has not been added so i'll talk about this one syndrome just as an example the self limited uh, familial neonatal epilepsy this is caused by mutation in the voltage gated potassium channel genes kcnq2 or kcn Q3. It is an autosomal dominant disorder. Seizures occur typically on day two or day three of life. The baby is well in the first day. There's no perinatal problem. And day two or day three, they have seizures. Usually, there is a family history of uh, neonatal seizures because it is an autosomal dominant condition. Uh, seizures typically are tonic or tonic sequential with asymmetric tonic posturing, which evolves to unilateral or asynchronous bilateral clonic movements. And they can be followed by autonomic symptoms such as apnea and desaturation. Between the seizures, the babies are otherwise healthy with a normal neurological exam. The interdictal EG is usually normal and the seizures typically resolve in early infancy. So if you see this baby, so this was a baby who started having seizures on the second day of life. Normal neurological exam and normal EG between seizures. So interesting thing, ictal EG, they can have a prolonged EG suppression, generalized EG suppression. And that gives a clue that this could be a KCNQ2 uh, related disorder. So it, just, it started with a tonic posturing, and now there is a clonic jerking, which is asymmetric. So this is a baby with a benign familial neonatal, sorry, not benign, self limited uh, familial neonatal seizures. She was found to have KCNQ2 mutation. Now, this, uh, this is second case. This is an 11-month-old baby, baby boy, who presented with two weeks of history of jerky movements, mostly seen in awake state of while falling asleep, and uh, they seem to occur in clusters, spontaneous onset, no precipitating or provoking factors. This child was developmentally normal. Now, any baby, any infant who presents with the jerky movements, one has to be very cautious that we could be dealing with infantile spasms and such a baby should be urgently brought in for an EG because uh, the delay in treatment can affect the treatment outcome and treatment prognosis. So this baby, sorry, I think I switched the slides. So anyway, that baby had a uh, benign, uh, the self-limited myoclonic epilepsy of infancy. We don't call it self-limited, but in those babies, uh, the interictal EG can show generalized uh, polyspike wave discharges or it can be normal. 
the ictal EG typically shows a polyspike wave discharge and there is no hip arrhythmia. What we're looking for is that we should not see any slowing, any hip arrhythmia, and uh, the babies are otherwise fine, developmentally fine, and they will respond very well to sodium valproate. Now, I will not spend more time on the most common self-limited epilepsies in children that we see. So two of them, one is called uh, SELECTS, which was earlier called uh, benign prolantic epilepsy or benign uh, childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. And the other one, which was earlier called panatipolos syndrome, but which is now called self-limited epilepsy with autonomic seizures. So basically, four syndromes are described as self-limited uh, epilepsy syndromes in childhood. They're all focal epilepsies. That is one thing. So they have some common features that they have age-dependent occurrence and antecedent history is usually unremarkable. So these children are usually developmentally normal. Cognition and neurological examination is normal. Remission usually occurs by puberty. It's a classical seizure semiology, which we'll discuss, and specific EG features. So the uh, they have been divided into group one and group two. Group one is these two conditions, which are the most common self-limited uh, epilepsy syndromes in children. So this is uh, the one at the left hand most is the one which occurs at the earlier age group, the celias or self-limited epilepsy with autonomic seizures. Usually they start at three to six years of age. And we uh, select, which starts by three to usually later age group, but peak is at seven years of age. These two are the most commonest, and these two will 100% almost remit by adolescence. So that is why they group to that when we know the prognosis is much more certain in these two conditions. These two, the group two ones, so one is childhood occipital visual epilepsy, which was earlier called as um, gasto epilepsy or late onset occipital epilepsy of gasto. And the second one, photosensitive occipital lobe epilepsy, which is now called pole. So these two conditions, the prognosis is not that clear. They will likely remit, but they may persist. They occur slightly later and they, than these two. That's one thing. The other thing is that there is not so much of a guarantee that they will remit. They are very likely to remit, but they may persist beyond adolescence. So let's start with this patient. It's a six-year-old girl. She was pre-morbidly normal. She presented with two episodes of seizures in the last three months. Both were in sleep. Uh, they were associated with drooling, twitching of the mouth. Child appeared as if she was trying to speak, but she was unable to speak. Her family history was not significant. Her examination was uh, normal. And uh, what do we think? So this is typically the history that you get in self-limited uh, epilepsy of childhood with centrotemporal spikes. So these are, uh, when you do the EG, in, when you did the EG in her, you see the spike wave discharges in the centrotemporal region. So you see, you can see a phase reversal, you can see phase reversal in this P4, one phase reversal here, C4. So when you see a double phase reversal in the bipolar montage, in the central temporal region, sometimes central parietal regions, Think of this condition, 100%, because you usually will not see a double phase reversal on a bipolar montage. And second thing to look for, what happens during sleep? In sleep, there is a marked sleep activation, as you can see in this patient. Now these centrotemporal discharges are so much more clear, so much more marked, more frequent. So this is the classical uh, selects, which was earlier called as BECTS or benign Rolandic epilepsy, it is the most common and most characteristic form of self-limited focal epilepsy. And it's pretty common. The prevalence is 15% in children. And uh, onset usually is 3 to 7, 3 to 14, but the median age is around 7 to 8 years. So clinical features are the seizures are usually nocturnal. They will Seizures will occur in sleep. And they're not very frequent. They are often single focal seizures. And this is involving the perisylvian area of the brain. So we have the perisylvian area of the brain is the area for the mouth and the uh, perioral areas. So patients will present with unilateral facial sensory motor symptoms. So oropharyngolaryngeal manifestations are very common, like drooling, like speech arrest, hypersalivation. And rarely, they can also have secondary generalized tonic-clonic seizure. So typically they will occur at sleep onset, just before or just before awakening. So typically a non-REM uh, phenomenon of uh, seizure. 
and brief seizures, one to three minutes. So 25% uh, will have only one seizure and only 8% will have really frequent seizures. And when seizures are frequent, they often occur in clusters separated by long intervals, but the total duration of active epilepsy is short. So mostly it's like one to two years or they will grow out of it. So etiology is complex, polygenic inheritance. And sometimes this is important to remember that uh, centrotemporal spikes by themselves are an autosomal dominant phenomenon with age-dependent penetrance. So sometimes in a child with, with this kind of history, if you do uh, an EG in siblings or other family members, even if they don't have epilepsy, no clinical history of seizure, you can still get the centrotemporal spikes. And this is important to remember that sometimes when we get a vague history of an event, which we're not sure whether it was a seizure or not, and you do an EG in a child and you find centrotemporal spikes, remember that this could be an age-dependent phenomenon and not necessarily correlating with a child's epilepsy unless you get a typical history of nocturnal seizures with the periodal symptoms like salivation, uh, speech arrest, drooling. The EG shows centrotemporal spikes which are age dependent. They peak at 7 to 10 years. They may persist despite clinical remission. So this is another thing to remember. This is one condition where if the child has been seizure free for if you have chosen to treat and the child is seizure free for two years, do not repeat an EEG to uh, see whether we can stop the anti-seizure medication or not because the EEG will likely remain abnormal. EEG will likely continue to show the spikes because they are an age-related phenomenon. And there is a marked sleep amplification. This is the other thing. They can be unilateral or bilateral. And the background is usually normal. The other phenomenon to look for in these patients, look at the referential montage. So in the referential montage, there are two things to see. One thing to see is that you see a phase reversal even in the referential montage. This is a very unusual phenomenon which you will see only in this condition. The other thing that you see is what is called the tangential dipole. By tangential dipole, most dipoles actually are radial. Radial in, so in, For radial dipoles, when you look in the referential montage, you will find that all the uh, spikes will be pointing upwards because if they are all radially aligned uh, dipoles. Whereas in tangential dipoles, you will see the um, like the uh, the frontal. There will be frontal positivity because in electrophysiology we must have learned in the previous sessions. So the convention is that a downward deflection is called positive. So you'll see a positivity in the frontal electrodes, the frontal central electrodes, whereas you see a, a negativity in the temporal electrodes. So this is typically the tangential dipole, which is very typical in children with um, selects. So, so they can, usually they are cognitively normal. However, they can have minor cognitive and behavioral problems and language executive function, attention, memory and behavioral problems can occur. So I will show one more case to show that this sometimes is not uh, uh, as, uh, you know, as easy to treat and a good condition to have. And that's why they actually remove the term benign. So it's, he's a 12 year old boy. He has history of seizures episodes in the last two years all in sleep with mouth twitching head turned to one side clonic jerking of one upper limb drooling he's developmentally normal poor but there was a problem that they complained of poor school performance and behavior which was noticed for the last one behavioral problems like aggression and behavioral issues noticed for the last one year so look at the awake record it looks pretty okay and uh, so good background nothing really but as soon as drowsiness occurred with alpha dropout, you start seeing the spikes. Okay. And you see the typical uh, centrotemporal spikes <laughs> and another page of drowsiness. And then the spikes start increasing a little bit. And see, just as soon as the child fell asleep, what you see is almost like a, uh, what we actually now called, um, we call it EE swas, like earlier term was ESES. Uh, electrical status epilepticus in sleep or continuous spike waves during sleep and uh, this is what it is so they're continuous and these are continuous almost like generalized spike wave during sleep now this is called uh, epileptic encephalopathy the spike wave activation during sleep this is almost that kind of a pattern so you see the whole sleep record was like if you calculated the spike wave index it was probably like 90 percent so one percent of children with selects can go into this ESCS or what is now called ee swas uh, spectrum and what is important to remember is that sometimes it is the treatment with carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine which can precipitate a condition like this so when you get a history 
that <laughs> started like a typical case of selects, but has started now worsening. Always check, is it drug related? Has it has a child received carbamazepine, ox carbamazepine, even phenytoin, lemotrigine? These conditions can precipitate um, a ECS kind of a picture in children with um, selects. And some this is actually now considered a continuum that um, selects can be continuum with Landau, Kleffner, and ESCS. So we need to so it can be like the same genetic predisposition, like sometimes a like green two-way mutations. Green mutations can predispose to both selects as well as Landau Kleffner. So this can be a spectrum depending on where you catch the child. And sometimes um, these can evolve into there used to be a term called pseudo Lennox. We don't use these terms anymore, but they can evolve into other seizure types. Then we need to real an atypical benign partial epilepsy. We don't use these terms, but some child these can, can have an atypical evolution into an epileptic encephalopathy type of a picture and may require other treatments such as steroids. Okay, so that was selects. Now moving on to the other common self-limited uh, childhood epilepsy syndrome. I'll start with this case. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a three-year-old girl who was brought with history of fever, cough, and cold for two days. And when sleeping, she had prolonged episodes of vomiting, followed by eye deviation to the right side, and then she became unconscious. And she was unconscious for the next five hours. But this is very atypical for a seizure. So mostly in seizures, children recover consciousness within a few minutes. But this, if you see, she had a febrile illness, and when she and this seizure occurred in sleep, she had ictal vomiting. She had eye deviation to one side. So whenever something like this happens for the first time, obviously you're worried. You'll think of a CNS infection or is it a migraine variant like cyclical vomiting? Um, and of course, could it be epilepsy? There was an eye deviation. There was a prolonged loss of consciousness. This particular child underwent an imaging CSF metabolic workup, which is all normal. But look at the EEG. So the EEG showed a, a marked sleep activation of here occipital occipital spike wave discharges. So this is a typical of self-limited uh, uh, autonomic, self-limited epilepsy with autonomic seizures. So earlier it was called early onset benign childhood occipital epilepsy or Panitipolo syndrome. So this condition was called occipital epilepsy because uh, children frequently have occipital spikes, but then it was understood that it was not really always occipital. You can have spikes actually from anywhere. The defining feature is not the occipital spikes. The defining feature is the autonomic seizures. So the autonomic features are very, very important. So one thing is important. Some features are important, like very early age, age at onset is usually typically between three to six years of age in developmentally normal children. These kids are completely normal before this. The other thing to remember is that these seizures, just like the seizures in selects, these seizures also typically occur in sleep. The third thing is these are typically autonomic seizures. So autonomic means what are the autonomic features? So one is ictal MSS. So vomiting is a very predominant symptom. Other autonomic features which can occur include pallor, midriasis, and very prolonged loss of consciousness as lasting several hours. And you could be worried that am I dealing with a an infect first time? Of course, anybody would be worried that this could be a CNS infection. But when these seizures occur, repeat, if they're second or third, you're more confident that this is really epilepsy. But the good thing is that even though there is a prolonged loss of consciousness, the child is completely well when they're awake. And there can be a past history of febrile seizures in 70%. And there is usually many times there's an overlap with selects. So in 90% of the cases, the EG shows multifocal spike sharp wave complexes, often shifting from one region to another. Occipital spikes predominate. That is why the earlier term came as occipital epilepsy. But they do not occur in a third of patients. But EG can be normal in 10%. So if you get a clinical history very typically, you can diagnose this syndrome even with a normal interactive EEG. So prognosis is remarkably benign. That's why it was called benign. 50% uh, will have just one to five seizures. 90% go into complete uh, remission. 10 to 20% may later develop another self-limited epilepsy syndrome like selects or COF, the childhood occipital visual epilepsy. So uh, sometimes in uh, people may not choose to treat, but treatment is not the um, focus of this um, uh, session, obviously. Rarely, they may evolve into, again, just like selects, they may also evolve into the ESCS pattern. This is very rare, but it can happen. Okay, now the last condition that I'll discuss today a seven-year-old boy, pre-morbidly normal. So he's, he's an older child. 
and his typical history was that he has transient loss of vision for two months he with this loss lasts about 15 to 30 seconds so he gets transiently blind 15 to 30 seconds lasting multiple times a day no history of loss of consciousness no jerky movements no visual hallucination no headache vomiting but the mother has a family history of migraine so so initially he was worked up by the ophthalmologist he had a normal exam ophthalm exam was completely normal uh, they did find a refractory error and they uh, advised him spectacles but the vp eg erg everything was normal mri brain was normal so despite the spectacles this problem did not uh, subside and obviously refractory error will not present like this so he was referred for a neurological opinion and we got an eg done and you see the eg just when the started record was started, like any record, we make the patient lie down, close the eyes, and you can see there was con continuous, almost continuous occipital spikes in this patient. And these spikes went on, 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 then the eyes were closed, and when the eyes were open, the spikes disappeared. And in fact, you can see a nice uh, mu rhythm here coming. So when the eyes were open, spikes totally went off. This is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, so this can occur. This is uh, in uh, another condition called eye closure sensitivity, which is seen in what was earlier called uh, Jevon syndrome, but now again it's just called epilepsy with eyelid myoclonia. So and this uh, that is one uh, possibility. The other possibility is it is just the change from lightness uh, fixation. So when the eyes are closed, the fixation is removed. And so for some epilepsies, the trigger for the spikes is removing the fixation. So when the eyes are closed, the fixation is removed and the spikes come. When the eyes open, the child begins to fixate and the spikes go away. So how can we check this? So we can check this by either making the child wearing both of those, those prism glasses, frenzel glasses, which removes the fixation. Eyes are open and fixation removed and still this, then the spikes come back. Or we can just keep a white paper in front of the child's eyes. Uh, then you know that the and if the spikes come back and the fixation is removed despite the eye being open and that is how you differentiate this condition this from uh, eye closure sensitivity so this particular so eye closure again they came back and then i we demonstrated that eye open again the spikes went away so then we put back the white paper to remove the fixation so with when the white paper was kept and fixation was removed the spikes came back so this is fixation this is called the phenomenon is called fixation of sensitivity okay this is different from eye closure sensitivity in eye closure it is just eye closure and eye, eye opening this white paper thing will not happen this is fixation of sensitivity which is typically dis described in these two syndromes uh, the gastro and even panaticolos but now it is known that it can possibly see in many other occipital epilepsies so this is what is called the childhood occipital uh, visual epilepsy, which was earlier termed as late onset childhood occipital epilepsy of gasto. Now the new term is POV. The age is of onset is 8 to 11 years. And uh, so these are typical, these are occipital seizures. Unlike the panatipolos, which are autonomic seizures, these are occipital seizures. They primarily manifest with elementary visual hallucinations, blindness or both. Uh, many of them have postictal headache, migraine-like. And with interictal EEG, will show occipital paroxysms, typically with this fixation of sensitivity phenomenon. So prognosis here, like I said, um, again, many of them will remit, but uh, some of them can persist. It's not, so this is a group two. It's not as clear as the, um, the selects and celias, where we can be pretty confident in prognosticating families that the child will grow, grow out of it by adolescence. Here, we have to be a little guarded that, yes, very good chance. But there is a small possibility that he will persist to have seizures. So this is actually a continuum which has been described. Uh, and sorry, this is an older uh, paper's um, you know snapshot. So these are age-related um, syndromes. So in in young children, you can have febrile seizures. In older children, this is uh, panatipolos or celias. And when they get even older, like seven, eight, nine years of age, the uh, selects. So what there's just like you have the concept of epileptic encephalopathies, which are age dependent, which you will learn in the next session. So that is like the how the brain uh, reacts. The developing brain will react in a particular um, epilepsy syndrome way on the injury. So whatever be the brain injury, for example, malformation or say an um, you know a genetic insult or genetic genetic problem or so in the very young age group, the uh, like zero to three months of age, 
Uh, babies will typically have tonic seizures and the EG shows birth suppression pattern. When they grow older, like four to six months of age, <laughs> they develop infantile spasms, the EG shows hips arrhythmia. And when they're older, like after three years of age, they develop multiple seizure types and the EG shows slow spike wave discharges and they develop Lennox Castor syndrome. So that is an age dependent manifestation of the epileptic process. Similarly, even for the self limited syndromes, these are age limited, these are these can be considered age dependent expressions of the epilepsy. In some children, it seems to be there's a spectrum which um, there's a biological continuum of these conditions. And so to summarize, uh, I will again say that selects and celias are the most common self-limited focal epilepsies, epilepsy syndromes in children. The recognition is important for diagnosis and prognosis. In both, the seizures will occur in sleep. And so interictal EEG abnormalities are activated in sleep. So another thing to remember is that one must always get a sleep EEG in these conditions. Uh, in uh, celias, these are young children and probably you will anyway need a sleep EEG. They will not cooperate much for an awake EEG. But select sometimes 10, 11 year olds, uh, awake record is easily obtainable and then if you don't do sleep you may completely miss the centrotemporal spines so clinical uh, history is completely different in both the celias as younger age group and both of seizures and sleep that is common but in celias the predominant seizure types are autonomic seizures prominent feature of ictal vomiting retching pallor and prolonged loss of consciousness a uh, selects affects older children with predominant of perirolantic symptoms like uh, the uh, perioral drooling speech arrest. So EEG is diagnostic in these two conditions, but one must be sure to order a sleep record. <coughs> they have both have good prognosis. They know, they, however, they have issues. They may not be totally benign. That's why the term benign has been replaced by self-limited. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, I think uh, Suvasini is busy with the birthday celebrations. Uh, okay. Sangeeta, there are no questions so far, but uh, we could right. just, uh, you know, uh, summarize. So uh, I will just, uh, you know, ask a few things to you. You can ask a few things to me. So uh, Dr. Sangeeta, you will agree that in children, we should always try, not only in children, in adults also, we sleep should try to always increase the sleep, uh, you know, uh, component of absolutely. the Absolutely. It's yes, very important that you do sleep EG. Otherwise, you may miss the diagnosis, diagnosis. and you know this thing. And often you advise sleep EG, but you should make sure that the sleep changes have come and the EG may uh, you have seen sleep changes. Otherwise, you know, sleep EG bola, I say nahi, child soya nahi karke aa jata hai wapas. So, so the, the, the participants should look out for vertic sharpe, sleep spindles, mm, complexes. They may not go into stage three or REM sleep because you know the interictal EEG time is limited, and generally, you know, REM comes after 90 to 120 minutes. But generally, stage one and stage two will come. Yes. So you'll be able yes. to make out the K complexes. Yes. Uh, you should, maybe, you should tell the parents to be prepared for a little longer time, you know, and tell the technician also to. So there is one question here uh, that, Matt, what sleep. is epilepsy yeah. with the auditory character and what kind EG seen? Epilepsy mm. with auditory character. So, <laughs> so there is uh, there are epilepsies. Uh, there is temporal lobe uh, epilepsy with auditory hallucinations, uh, which has uh, you know a kind of a mutation to it called the GI1 mutation. Uh, there is also, uh, you know, symptomatic epilepsies like I'm sure Sangeeta and myself, we see uh, cortical dysplasias or glyphosis yeah. of the area which can cause auditory hallucinations. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta, uh, any other one that more, comes to your mind? One more thing I wanted to say that often when you find dysplasia, uh, but if there is a family history, always do a genetic study because dysplasia, it may be a focal seizure in that, but if component to that dysplasia also. And you know, then the uh, it may differ. Uh, the prognosis may differ if you take up a, uh, a, so for a that genetic uh, variant. Uh, Doctor Sangeeta, should we stop meds in benign? Of course, we don't use the term benign. Uh, Self-limiting epilepsy with uh, central temporal spikes, uh, with no seizures. So. Uh, Personally, uh, I do not stop medicines uh, for these patients because it has been uh, identified that these spikes are associated with cognitive issues and learning issues and behavioral issues, 
which does improve on treating them and reducing the slight, uh, slight, uh, spike count. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta, how would you manage these uh, patients? Uh, I think she got disconnected. So some people choose not to treat, but then- well, I got disconnected for a while. Yeah, yeah. So some people choose not to treat, but uh, uh, you know, you have to do a rigorous cognitive and behavioral evaluation for the child. Uh, mm. Before saying that it is, as uh, Dr. Suhasni said, it's not truly benign and yes. you can ignore the spikes. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta? Atypical evolution is there and then you have to keep a check on it, you know. So uh, even this, see, often there are papers also that uh, uh, this intermittent discharges may cause, cause minor cognitive impairments. There, are, there, are, there is a literature on that also. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to treat. I also. Uh, there's another very interesting question. What is the mode of treatment of atypical beds? So, uh, uh, Dr. Sangeeta? I think she got yeah, so yeah. see, basically, uh, you should uh, sometimes if you have given a thing like carbamazepine or this thing, it may have precipitated this, uh, you know, atypical variant. So, first, you need to check your anti epileptics whether they are uh, this thing. And secondly, sometimes if it is more than 80 90 percent, then uh, steroids or IVIG is also been pres prescribed uh, for this. Yeah, so, so we also have tried ketogenic diet in these children. And mm. that also is supposed to be of help. So steroids, definitely immune modulation. Uh, in yes. some sense, we have given IVIG also. IVIG also. And uh, also ketogenic diet. All these can yeah. be tried. Because right. these children have more cognitive issues and behavioral issues. Mm. And their results are very bad. I mean, they don't get control easily. Mm. So Balaji has asked a question. Uh, if the patient has occipital spikes and then it shifts, shifts, centrally, like it goes anteriorly, then, mm. uh, you know, uh, uh, and the patient does not have development of delay or speech delay. So you can see shifting dipoles in childhood. You can see, mm. you know, O1, O2 spikes and central spikes, just like you see frontotemporal and central spikes in a Rolandic uh, seizures. So, uh, you know, and there is this overlap, like Suhasini also mentioned it, Dr. Sangeeta, isn't it? That not everybody fits yeah. into the tight box or the tight definition. Sometimes there's a gray zone and a overlap. They may have the a, uh, you know, form, form first of one. Yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, though we like to categorize and classify that this is this and this is this, you know, patients have not read the textbook. So they do have overlap syndromes. They do have gray zones. Like uh, the atypical, uh, you know, uh, Rolandic could be treated like, uh, you know, a Lennox, uh, uh, a Lando Kleffner uh, or a variant or whatever. So, you know, those kind of things are there. There's another question here. Can sedative be used to induce sleep if child does not fall asleep? Sometimes okay. we use trichloral syrup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but not uh, more than that usually. But the best thing is, you know, you tell parents to keep the child little awake. So, yes. you know, the natural sleep, if they're tired and or take an appointment where they're likely to sleep. Like if their child is sleeping in the afternoon, every afternoon, tell them to take an appointment during that time. So the natural sleep will be always better. But sometimes very, this thing, you can give trichloral syrup. So the dose is 25 milligram per kg uh, syrup. But we do do a second dosing. And sometimes if they don't sleep with that, we do give Q-tapin. We use Q-tapin in few patients. Uh, sometimes we use Respiridone, particularly if there's a very hyperactive behavior. So we use Respiridone. Yeah. Also. Some people also use this mal malatonin, uh, this thing, but I don't know. I have yes. not used it. Uh, uh, yes, have yes. you used Manjit? Uh, melatonin mm -hmm. is very mild, you know, and if a hyperactive and crying child is not sleeping, yeah. they don't sleep with melatonin. Very mild. Absolutely. So, so I have uh, I tried once or twice, yeah. but then I didn't feel very effective. Even in adults, melatonin is asleep. <laughs> so there's one question: uh, Can a typical febrile seizure be present as present as bets? Uh, means mm -hmm. patient has a typical febrile, but is actually bets. Uh, usually, bets do not have fever. No, Sangeeta. Yeah, it, not febrile seizures are not described in beds. Yeah. And the uh, the beds have prominent oral and you know their distortion of the face. 
so they face, have yeah, focal uh, seizures and drooling, vocalization, mm -hmm. distortion of face uh, with the gurgling sound night, coming nocturnal, in the night. Nocturnal seizure. Yes, and they will be in sleep mostly. So, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. What is the proposed mechanism of carbamazepine aggravating silex? So one theory is that these are overlap syndromes of absence or typical absence you know, a typical uh, Rolandic, these are all overlap with gifts at one extreme. So because of this overlap, we know absence response, you know, very exquisitely to valproate. So that is one of the theories that it's better to bet on valproate in these children because some of them mm. can get aggravated with carbamazepine. Dr. Sangeeta, you Absolutely. have any yeah, other... Yeah, I agree. No, I agree that... Um... We don't know the exact mechanism what is there, but definitely carbamazepine aggravates generalized seizures. Similarly, in this also, like divalproate and valproate are preferred drug compared to the carbamazepine. So uh, there's another question. Can phenergan be used for inducing sleep? Uh, I, I have know. never used phenergan in children. Yeah. <laughs> We have never needed to use phenargan. Sangeeta, you have used any? No, no, I have also not used phenargan. Yeah. Not used phenargan. The question is another question. That's is, too, can, too strong. Yeah. Yeah. A typical febrile seizure, can it transform into beds? Well, as uh, you know, we said that a typical febrile seizure and guest plus hmm. and absence and uh, a typical absence and Rolandic epilepsy of, uh, you know, a typical type. All these are overlap syndromes. So yes, you can have febrile seizures before and you could have a bed like picture later. That I have seen. But then these are very difficult to control patients. They're not the ones which get controlled easily. Yeah, but the beds will typically are once in six months and, you know, uh, very well controlled. But atypical febrile seizures will be definitely more frequent, daytime seizures and things like that, you know. So last question, what change does pedicloral have on EEG? Um, as far as I know, uh, it may induce a little bit of beta, so, no? Uh, yeah, so, uh, fast, but not uh, not that it transforms. Uh, it does not suppress the epileptic form discharges or anything. Yeah. So, mm. uh, is febrile seizure really epilepsy or is it acute symptomatic seizure? It comes under, uh, you know, febrile seizures is uh, triggered by fever. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta, you want to... Uh... Yeah, but, you know, uh, see, it is, though it is uh, triggered by fever, but often it is later on associated with uh, either a Jeff class or a temporal lobe epilepsy. So that's why it is not considered very uh, symptomatic alone. It is a type of epilepsy in some of the patients. It does evolve into an epilepsy in some of the patients. So... Um, cognitive disturbances associated with Rolande is treatment advised? Uh, I generally tend to treat patients with Rolandic because there's high amount of parental anxiety. Most seizures occur in sleep and sometimes go unnoticed. So they may say two seizures, but actually the child may have had more than two seizures. And then these children generally have a hyperactive behavioral issue or uh, they have school, uh, you know, the, their complaints from school coming that the child is not sitting quiet and uh, class. So I tend to uh, manage these patients with uh, medicines. Uh, Sangeeta, do you... Yeah, I, also, I, also, I also send for psych, uh, therapy, you know. Uh, apart from the medicine, definitely medicine we have to change, but also therapies uh, can be helping uh, the childhood behavior therapy and this thing. And uh, if after that, if the, it doesn't con come under control, you might have to give uh, you know, typical drugs for behavioral problems you know, which psychiatrists give. The last question is, if the child doesn't sleep with pedicloral, what do you give? So, as I said, we do give quetiapine. Just today we had a child uh, who's not mm. uh, going to sleep with pedicloral. So, we do give 25 milligram of quetiapine and it's pretty safe. The child goes to sleep. Yeah. Anything else you use, Sangeeta? Or, uh, no. We can't use benzodiazepines because they no, shut off the discharges. Absolutely. Yeah. And they will produce a lot of beta, you know, the diazepines. Yeah. Mm. So what is psychogenic epilepsy will be dealt with uh, on Next 26 time, by Dr. Yeah. Lemia, 26. Yes, yes. I yes. think we are done with the questions. Uh, sure. Okay. sure. Last question is, what is the first line medication for beds? I tend to use uh, Valproate. Sangeeta, which Same. one? I, al 
I also tend to use Valparais, but there are somewhere in literature people have written Oxcarb as a first, but I am never very comfortable with Oxcarb. Pediatricians often use that as first line. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I don't use that. I use Valproate. Dye Valproate most probably. So, uh, occipital epilepsy is, is it associated with cognitive issues? Um, I think there are a few studies which have clearly shown that. Though we have personally, I have not personally done, you know, uh, yeah. serial cognitive evaluations. Maybe one of the younger participants can take it up as uh, a research topic and answer the question. Uh, Sangeeta, yeah. uh, you could put I, your I agree. We and... don't have a longitudinal long time studies, you know, yeah, for yeah. seeing the. So I think it's a good event. thing to research. And please, the younger participants here can set up a multi centered because occipital lobe, we don't see thousands of cases. Each center will have, you know, 20, yeah, 30 cases. cases. So we can compile these cognition cases. Cognition is mainly topic. studied in the beds, you know. Cognit cognition is studied very often in beds, but not in occipital lobe yeah. So I think we'll close the course. Uh, yes. yes. and Dr. Sangeeta, thank yeah. you for uh, taking thank the questions you, with me. <laughs> yeah, and we thank Lara and on for supporting us uh, yeah. with this unconditional uh, uh, and uh, restricted educational grant. And I thank all the participants and uh, both of us uh, ask you all to become members of the Indian Yes, yes. please do become. You. Okay, Good bye. Time. Next time, bye. Dr. Shafali, and then after that, psychogenesis. Okay, yeah. bye. Good night. Good night, Sangeeta. Bye.